Um, so my name is Richard Corr, for those of you who have not met. Um, I work at the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Wellness and Research Centre, but we just say Austin Health generally. So um, I'm he on, here on behalf of a number of people who um, I don't have really have the time to thank individually. So uh, we've just put in a research data warehouse, and you might think, how do you actually get one of these? Actually, we had just money left over from the Cancer Centre, so it was a fortuitous funding um, arrangement. And today, I just thought I might quickly run through the challenges that we went through, but I might do it a little bit backwards in the interest of time. So we might start with the product, what we've been able to do with it, having just launched a couple of weeks ago, and then go back through, you know, so we'll establish utility first and go forward from there. With the warehouse, we've been able to do one single project so far and a number of other ones that'll come. There is a score that's out there called the Quick Sepsis Organ Failure Assessment Score, which is used in emergency departments and ICUs to predict mortality in patients presenting with severe infection, or maybe that you should recognise as having a severe infection. The, the ba basic premise is that you could get people's observational status or their vital signs and then predict their mortality in patients with uh, suspected infection. So if they have a systolic blood pressure less than 100 millimetres, uh, altered GCS or a high respiratory rate, it predicts for mortality. And in the States, this is associated with over a 10% mortality if you have two or more of those things positive and you have a potential infection. So obviously that type of score could be very useful in recognising people with severe infection and potentially instituting antibiotics earlier to improve the outcome. So one of our clinicians initially came to us and said to us, well, why can't we just use that data given that we've got about two or three years of data from taking these observations in the emergency department. And this, was act this formed the basis of our, one of our user, user acceptance tests. So we actually went through, sat down with him and worked the project out. We took all the patients that went to the ED and had electronic observations, so 165,000 patients. Then we actually looked for people with suspected infection. So for this we looked at in, within those people who had a microbial culture and an antibiotic prescribed, assuming that they would be probably people at risk of infection. And we found 9,000 people within that group. And then we actually then went in and found people who, uh, well, took all their observations and divided them into two groups, people who had the Q server positivity, so two or more criteria, and then people who didn't. And there were about 1,500 people who were Q server positive. And I actually think that this is the real uh, this is a paradigm project for us because it takes into account lots of different types of endpoints and, and little things. So you, you end up taking um, attendance data, medical orders, pathology orders, observations and results, and you can roll them all together into a project. And it actually illustrates why you want to research data warehouse, because it's fast, because you can scale it. It goes to 165,000 patients in about a minute. It goes all the way down to who delivered the antibiotic and you can link multiple data sets across your hospital record. So you might have administrative data sets that sit separately to your clinical record. In this particular case, we found that there was actually an increased risk of death or ICU stay with these patients, but it was far less than in the States. So because of that, it wasn't actually very useful in a tertiary hospital in Melbourne because the care was probably at a, at a level that you wouldn't benefit from additional predictive tools. But in terms of implementation, to get to that answer probably took us about three hours. But we had a researcher who knew exactly what they wanted. And I think if anyone else wanted to do that type of study, they would probably think that it would take a longer time to get to that data and link it all together. That kind of brings me on to the next point. Who are you designing the research data warehouse for? That last study was conceived and designed in three hours. But the average clinician won't have the expertise or the knowledge to do that. So we did do some scoping exercises at the start to think about who the types of people we were building the data, data warehouse would be. So you might just have the, the, the level of consulting. So you might, people might come and say, I want some data. You might have people who might actually want to be involved in the data extraction process. So these are the, the guided models so that you could go to the business intelligence team if you couldn't do the query. Or you might be an absolute ninja and not need anyone. And these are the people who would be self-service. And actually the people that were probably of most interest to us were the middle group that wanted to actually do a little bit of the data exploration by themselves. Because 
you can get them hooked on something that they might learn a little bit more about. You understand that the, you know, the processing of data is an ongoing learning process. And when we went out to consult with benchmarking other services, what we found was that initially you had not very many data ninjas because they would always be there and they'd always kind of be using the record as they had access to it. But you might have quite a few of these guided people. But then after time, they would then collapse back into the consultant model because they kind of didn't uh, have the time to pursue it further. So that actually guided our implementation strategy. One of the other lessons was we had a consultant come in and ask people what types of data they wanted in the research data warehouse. And they wanted to just agree on, on, a, on a common data set to put in the data warehouse. And actually, we, we couldn't agree. So what, what's, what's happened is we put pretty much everything in our clinical record into the data warehouse, which I think is the best thing to do anyway. And then we built a, a tiered access model. So the consultant would you know, basically be what we do now. We go to a guy and we say, I need this data. They give you the data. But they work out, they basically translate your clinical query into a research question that can be answered with the data. You have the guided people who might be self-service with support. These people, we thought, might want to use dashboards as a kind of a gateway drug to get in and start to explore and visualize the data. Dashboards are pretty trendy, so we wrote a few of them. And the, the ninjas would just use SQL and obviously be used for operational reporting. And it, came, it struck me that this was actually a very brave move for our hospital to actually fund and develop because but we had this gu the gateway that a clinician or a researcher could go in and get the data without having to rely on a number of different people to get that data. But the true difference was that, apart from the data being linked, was that we were expanding the access to data to more people, so we were democratising that. We'll step back now to what's in our data warehouse. We have a Cerna system. We've been online for about seven years. Uh, it's got a lot of stuff in there. Clinical notes, discharge summaries, everything that's come through the emergency department, observations, medical orders, radiology orders, results, any structured data. The list goes on and on. We have a pharmacy dispensing system, which looks at basically drug dispensing and controls expensive drugs. And we also have an administrative system so these are kind of more patient attendances, demographics, and so on. And so the top kind of two, the yellow and the green, are effectively you know, primary care databases. They're used for clinical care. But the other database is a, is a purely administrative product, which basically, you know, I guess you do what's classically result, um, regarded as health services, so using it for research, but it's collected for billings purposes. Uh, and linking them together is, I think, pretty important. So what we actually did was we took all the databases and we linked them at an episode and a patient level so that people could query on either of those two types of uh, data sets instantly without having to do the link themselves. But that was perhaps the easiest part of what we did because as I told you, we just copied all the databases in there and you know, wrote some tables that, that flattened the data a little bit. The actual hard things were actually training and awareness, data security, and the kind of ethical and legal kind of governance framework that underwent it underpin that. We also sought consumer kind of engagement in what they thought about this data warehouse and what it meant for them. Um, we actually did, we do have an opt-out model for the, the only thing I have time to say is we have an opt-out model for the ethics for the data warehouse because all this data was actually available before we, we built the data warehouse. When you previously were going to do a research project, I don't know what it's like in your hospitals, but you would have your idea. Then you'd think, well, can I actually get the data from somewhere? How do I get the data? I'd go to my favorite guy and ask him. And if there was enough data to kind of think about actually a project that could be done, we'd then go through ethics process. Then we go back to the guy, get the identified data out, uh, and then analyze it. But it's usually not that simple because you go to one guy for the administrative data set, you go to another guy for the test data set, you go to the micro guys for the, you know, so it gets, it can be multiple people that you have to consult and then link the data back yourself which is onerous, and you end up paying a lot of stats for that. The new model is that we might actually, well, we, we are planning on giving out de-identified data access on application for limited time frames. So you can do your scoping exercise, then get your ethics, and then you self-serve the data out with the data access tool. So they're, thereby kind of bypassing the linkage and actual extraction, which sometimes the actual, um, it's getting the data out and the person to, to find the data that is the hard bit that takes the longest time. But I think this really does highlight what I said earlier, that clinician researchers thus play a very critical role in the new model uh, because um, they're in charge of the security. They're actually getting the data out. 
security is a joint responsibility, and every time you add a new type of user, you do actually kind of uh, engage some type, some form of risk at an organizational level. But the IT department does provide secure storage and access models and account validation for us. And the user then needs to understand their obligations and responsibilities in dealing with that data, because similar to a research project, you kind of say what you're going to do in your research, but then that we don't necessarily then say, well, how am I going to get that data and under what circumstances am I going to uh, use that data? Um, but then it's also critical that the user can then competently go and retrieve the data, which I think is the problem with us because we have this new kind of model. So we've just done the super user training for the warehouse. Basically, two guys can use the data warehouse, and one of them's me. So what, I've, what we've learned, because I know Jeff's standing there, I think we've overestimated the core competencies of clinicians, in particular, in actually accessing the data, because they don't even understand how the data is generated. It goes back to what we were saying before. Uh, and perhaps we've underestimated the importance of the user experience. And I thought that the BI product would give us a drag and drop interface, but I think even people are bouncing off that. So we need to go back and have a rethink. And I think people, just to kind of curtail this domain, domain experts, I think what we're going to do is aim for really small groups of people at the start and expand for there. So we might have oncology people, surgical people, maybe have a few disease uh, specialists or system specialists. There can be a cross-pollination of an initial small group of clinicians who use the data warehouse. And then some kind of service uh, extraction people who could help us from the university aspect. After this, I think it would be a mentorship model. We're just kind of hashing out the actual design of it. So you could then slowly train and enlarge, and people can keep training, and then eventually take over the world. But obviously, you would have a robust credentialing and government strategy underlying that. Uh, we do have a lot of work to do. Um, continuing to digitize hospital process, increasing the number of data elements in there, and sustainability. We do need to build a culture of data-driven research with university partners and with clinicians. But I think that the future is actually bright. I think that really we do need a new generation of clinicians who can do a little bit of data research, but they're not just going to happen now. They're going to happen in about two or three years, and we need to be ready. So I hope I've convinced you that a data warehouse is a good idea that you do need to think a little bit about the access model and the privacy issues, and that it may have to involve over time and be a little bit agile. Thanks very much.